Friends of mine, I'm glad they uh, were gracious enough to come back. The lovely wives are here, escorting them and giving them support, you know, Lydia, Lydia and Liz. And uh, who's going to talk first? I am. Okay. Those of you who don't know him, uh, I'll introduce uh, Gregory Scheimer. Greg, let's give a round of applause for Greg Scheimer. Okay, I have a lot of slides I want to go through tonight, so I'm going to go uh, a little quickly, and I'm not going to stop and describe everything. Um, I'm going to talk about the corals more in groups, then we're going to speak about some fish and some other invertebrates. Excuse me? Yeah, I'm trying to talk sideways, that's the, that's the problem. Oh well. Okay, the first group of slides we're going to look at is some soft corals that you can keep in your uh, reef aquarium. Uh, generally, uh, these are better choices for the beginning reef aquarists. Uh, they're usually less demanding than the stony corals. Hold on. How's that? Okay, to start again, the first group of corals I'm going to uh, have some slides are of uh, soft corals. Uh, these are generally uh, uh, what I recommend for beginning reef hobbyists. You can keep them with under uh, regular output fluorescent tubes as long as you have four tubes spanning the length of the aquarium. Uh, in terms of water movement, if you could see the coral gently swaying back and forth, you, you can generally say you have adequate water movement. Uh, the other requirements would be a well-skimmed aquarium and a minimum ma amount of microalgae. Anyway, the first, the first coral up here. You still can't hear me back there? It's working. It's working. This is, this is a yellow sarcophyton from, uh, from Tonga. The yellow color is a good indication of what kind of light you want to put this in. It's, it's bright light. If you could keep it under lower lighting, but it'll turn brown. If you have it under metal halide lights or VHO lighting, you can maintain this bright yellow coloration. The, you, you can find these in stores fairly regularly, but the problem is they don't ship very well, and they often have damage and, and bacterial infections. So just be careful. If, if you see any kind of necrosis on the body of the coral, uh, I wouldn't purchase it. It's another sarcophyte, and this is a propagated coral. I think these are coming out of Palau. These are really nice. They, they, they're not as sensitive as some of the other sarcophytons. They don't close their polyps. You could rub against this and it still stays open. A lot of the other sarcophytons go through a period where they close down for a week or even more where they slough off a slime coat. This particular species doesn't do that. I would keep an eye out for these. They're small and they have kind of a yellow tan color and, they, and they're coming in from Palau. They're propagated. Very nice coral. This soft coral is called Lemnalia. It's, uh, it's, I, I like to say it's a cross between like a Dendronafta and a Cladiella. It has zooxanthellae in its tissues, which means it manufactures some of its own food. But I think in order for this to survive, it needs some supplemental feeding. Doesn't require a lot of light. This could be kept down low in your aquarium, under an overhang, something like that. As long as it gets getting uh, some light, even uh, reflected light would be fine. This is Cladiella. This is an encrusting variety. This, this I recommend very highly. Uh, this is a good first coral. They do very well in the aquarium, uh, often outgrowing the space. In fact, if anything, these, these guys prefer to have some organics in the water. If your water is too clean, they tend to shrink and, and not do as well. But, uh, and they don't seem to be minded by, uh, mind microalgae in the aquarium. So th this is a real good coral for beginners. This is, like I said, an encrusting variety. The one you commonly see is a taller variety, they sometimes called cold coral. This is a lithophyton, another good soft coral. Doesn't require bright light. This could do very well under regular output fluorescent tubes. It's a couple of sarcoph that's a sarcoph uh, little sarcophyton there, like I was describing before. It looks like a little powder puff. These are the ones I said do very well. They're, they're not as sensitive as some of the other sarcophytons, and they stay with their polyps extended all the time. 
That's a Lobo fighting with a finger leather. That's a Singularia from Tonga. This is in uh, Gary Sheffitt's aquarium. This is a uh, Nephthia, or sometimes called an African tree. This also does very well in the aquarium. You don't see it for sale very often because they come out of Africa and there's not, uh, they stopped importing invertebrates out of Africa a while ago. But uh, you can still get one uh, as a propagated cutting. I think also Dick Perrin sells it at Tropicorium. But it does very well. Once it's established, it's literally a weed. This is the center of one of Gary Sheffitt's aquariums and it's been overtaken by this monster. It's a little green singularia. They're starting to come in now from, uh, I'm not sure where these are, from Indonesia. Solomon, Solomon Islands. Solomon. This is Pachyclavularia, another nice soft coral. It's an encrusting coral that creeps along the rocks and sends up these, these polyps here. Um, excuse me, that was Clavillary. This is Packy Clavillary. The names of these soft corals seem to be changing like almost on a daily basis. This is the uh, famous green star polyps. This isn't as easy to keep as is as, as often led to believe. Uh, if you have the right conditions, it grows like a weed, but if you have problems with microalgae in the aquarium, it won't open up and it'll eventually just waste away and die. So I, I wouldn't suggest this to beginners. Th this benefits a lot, this coral benefits from having those little uh, herbivorous hermit crabs in your aquarium because they, they tend to keep the, the base of this clean of microalgae and, and it stays open more. So if, if you're having problems with microalgae growing on top of the base of this, the green star polyps, you might want to add some extra hermit crabs. This is Xenia, pulsating Xenia on a stalk. This also does very well once it's established. It doesn't ship very well, but once you have it in your tank and it's settled in, it, it multiplies very quickly. In fact, these are, these are all propagated pieces in my aquarium. None of these were the original colony. And you can see the little baby that grew off to the right of the, uh, of the larger piece. This is the same uh, pulse. This is a different uh, species that are pulsating Xenia. In fact, I brought a couple of these for the auction. These, again, all grew from one piece. They kind of just propagated themselves and started creeping around the rock. This is Antonio Vargas' aquarium. These are just plain old red mushrooms, but I, this, these happen to be a nice uh, specimen that I saw in a store. In fact, I think they're still there, amazingly enough. Discus, uh, not th these are actinodiscus. These these are strange. Uh, these uh, don't do as well in bright. They they seem to like metal halide lighting, but they don't like it directly. These are growing in a tank with metal halide light, but they're they're vertical, um, so they're not getting hit by the light directly, and they're doing very well. This is the uh, green discosoma. These do very well in, in just about any kind of lighting. This is on the, in my tank on the metal halide lights, but again, it's vertical, so it's not getting any direct light at all, and, it, and it's doing very well. This green discosoma mushrooms. These are quite big. These are about six inches in diameter. These are uh, pelithoa. Actually, these came from the Gulf of Mexico. And these are in Gary Sheffitt's aquarium. No, that's not good. You, the, the one down, the, down below, there. You had a laser point that came in handy for something. I have no idea what that was. I'll try, I'll try not to do it again. Oh, okay. Parazuanthus, which are the yellow, uh, these yellow polyps, also a good specimen for a soft coral aquarium. If you feed them, they grow even faster, but they don't need to be fed in order to uh, survive and thrive.
You recognize this, Jim Carbone? This, this is a, a, a heteractus uh, anemone and a little skunk clown in a reef aquarium. I generally don't recommend putting anemones in reef aquariums. Uh, they, j just for the simple reason that they can walk around and uh, they have fairly potent stinging capabilities. But if you want to keep an, an anemone, the best thing to do is to put it in a species tank by itself. And another mistake we often make with anemones, I wouldn't put buy a little anemone and put a big clownfish. They could be a little too irritating and they could keep the anemone stays closed. So if you want to put an anemone in the tank, I would suggest leaving the clownfish out, which sounds kind of strange. Most people are attracted to the hobby. They want to set up a nice little tank with an anemone and a clownfish. Um, just make sure that either you get a large anemone and a small clownfish or a vice versa, a small anemone and, and, oh no, I said that wrong, a large anemone and a small clownfish. You don't want a large clownfish and a small anemone because he'll be rubbing against it all day, keeping it closed and it won't, it won't survive. Also, I, I find the anemones do better if you feed them twice a week, which, um, which normally isn't a problem, but um, you'll find shrimp often steal the food, so you kind of have to try and keep them away. In fact, that leads me to this next picture. I, this is a little heteractus anemone that's in my, uh, one of my reef aquariums, a little 40-gallon reef aquarium. And I've been trying to feed it, and every time I feed it, the cleaner shrimp and there's an arrow crab come and start ripping the food out of it. In fact, you can see the legs of the arrow crab right here. He hangs out right by the anemone because he knows that's where I squirt the food. So what I did is I bought this little porcelain crab and he immediately went into the anemone. These are, these are the little symbiotic crabs that live in association with anemones. They're filter feeders, but they serve a purpose because they protect the anemone. And every time now that the hour crab comes next to the anemone, this little porcelain crab bites his leg. So now I'm able to feed the anemone and the hour crab doesn't bother it any longer. So it's, it was just a theory I had and it actually worked. Okay, the next group is, are the large polyp stony corals. This is a, a, a symphelia. The large polyp, uh, polyp stony corals are a little uh, harder to keep than the soft corals, but, uh, but they're not difficult uh, if you have the right conditions. Uh, these can also be kept under regular output lighting, but you need, like I said, with the soft corals, at least four fluorescent tubes spanning the length of the aquarium. You're better off with, uh, with VHO tubes and uh, metal halide lighting, uh, of course. Um, it gives you a little bit more flexibility as to where you can place them in the aquarium. With regular output tubes, you're pretty much relegated to keeping them up towards the top of the aquarium. Which regular output tubes do you like? If you're going to do with reg go with regular output tubes, you'd, you'd want to do something like 50-50 with a daylight and an actinic mix either using two daylights and two actinics or using like four 50-50 tubes, which are the, uh, have the daylight and the actinic mixed into the same tube. And like this is symphelia. And the green color on the symphelia is another indication that it, it, it prefers a higher light area. That's a cinerina. This, this is a large polyp stony coral that uh, does not like bright light at all. Uh, this can do very well in a fluorescent lit tank. It's in a metal halide lit tank here, but it's being partially shaded, and it's, and it, it's doing very well. It also doesn't like a lot of water movement. Most of the large polyp stony corals don't like vigorous water movement. As long as you can see the tentacles moving back and forth, you know your circulation is good enough for these animals. It's a bubble coral. I think this is physogyra. Again, this one can do very well under fluorescent lighting. Gentle water movement. That's a close-up of a Plerogyra bubble coral. These are very hardy in the aquarium and they have potent stings. The problem is obtaining a healthy piece. They have very sharp coralites and uh, they often come in damaged and suffer from bacterial infections. But if you see one open and healthy in the store, uh, you could buy it. Just transport it very carefully because if you, it rubs against the side of the bag and you start puncturing, puncturing the flesh, you can, you can invite another bacterial infection. This is Nemenzophilia or a fox coral, I believe it's normally called in the stores. These again, these are another coral that's difficult to find a healthy specimen in the store. 
But once they're established, they do very well. They don't need bright lights. This is semi-shaded in a, in a metal halide lit tank, but this will do very well in a fluorescent lit tank. This is an open brain coral, a red open brain Trachophilia geoffrei. This is another coral that'll do well in, under fluorescent lights, especially when you see that red coloration. These come in a variety of color morphs. The red color morphs prefer, uh, come from deeper water and prefer dimmer lights. The bright green color morphs uh, are, come from shallower water or less turbid water, and, and you can get away with uh, brighter lighting. Ganiopora, which is another uh, large polyp stony coral. These are often another coral that's bought mistakenly by beginning hobbyists because it's, it's, it's such a flashy coral. But it, it's, we still haven't figured out how to keep this long term successfully. Some people have. I think some of the things you want to do with this is um, keep it at the bottom and sit it on sand, uh, especially the stochasi uh, variety. And uh, you want to have gentle water movement so you see the tentacles going back and forth. This also doesn't seem to appreciate very well skimmed water. These come from turbid lagoons and I think one of the mistakes is we try and keep too many things in the same aquarium. If you're going to have a, an aquarium specializing in say small polyp stony corals like aquapores and you're going to have heavily skimmed water, this coral probably won't do well. It'll probably do better in an aquarium with some soft corals and lagoon corals like uh, euphelias and cataphelias and trachophilias and th things of that nature and other large polyp stony corals. This is a uh, fungia. Again, these, these do best if you sit them on the, on the bottom of the tank, especially on sand. If you, you, you place them on rocks, they often get knocked over or they develop infections along the basin, and, and that usually is the beginning of the end. You see the bright purple coloration, it's an indication that it prefers higher light. Most of the fungias aren't particular about the light, but if you want to maintain that bright coloration, you really want it in direct light, and preferably metal halide when you see this bright color. It's another fungia with a, with a little pink purplish color. Again, these are all on the metal halide lights. This would do very well on the fluorescent lights, but that purple color will turn to brown. That's from uh, Joey Aiello's aquarium. This is a uh, fungia blown up. This is interesting. The reason it's blown up, and at least the reason I believe it's blown up, is because it's got sand constantly being dumped on it. And the way it rids itself of sand is by blowing up and transferring the sand off of its body. But it looks quite pretty when it's blown up. This is Blastomusa. It looks like red mushrooms, but this is actually a, a stony coral. Um, and and uh, another stony coral that does not like bright light. You could keep it in a metal halide tank, but it needs uh, indirect light. You could put it vertically or shade it under something. But this will do a lot better in a tank actually with fluorescent lights than metal halide lights. Uh, now we get into, uh, I guess we can call these medium polyp uh, stony corals. Um, th these, these all are generally characterized by, uh, uh, do better in aquariums with uh, bright light, VHO lighting and, and uh, metal or metal halide lighting, strong water movement, and, uh, and you really need a well skimmed aquarium, I believe. I forgot, I didn't tell you what that is. I think that's a Mon Montastria curta. This is a favia, and again, the bright green coloration is an indication that it came from a higher light area. You can see the way these corals uh, grow and propagate themselves. Well, actually, this is just the showing you growing. You see the polyp splitting down the middle. It's also one of the ways you can distinguish favias from favite uh, species corals. The favias um, grow through this uh, intratenticular budding, it's called. In other words, the polyps split in two. One becomes two, and you can, you can see that happening here. Also in the favi is the each polyp is, is, is its own independent coralite. They don't share walls. And you'll see in a few pictures down from here, you'll see the favites where the polyps share walls. Actually, it's the next picture. This is a little favites with two clownfish. And you can see the difference where the coralites are sharing walls. And the, uh, and the way these grow, instead of the polyp splitting in two, what will happen is you'll see a little bud form off the, off the side of one of the polyps. Uh, extra tenticular budding is the exact term. 
another Fabia, the famous Joey Ayula Fabia. This is a uh, uh, Montestrella cavernosa from the Caribbean. I, I put this in here to show you how these feed. At nighttime, the tentacles open up, as you see here, and it grabs food passing in the current. They don't need to be fed to thrive in the aquarium, but um, if you have one that has damage on it, I find that it'll often heal uh, faster if you feed it. And if you're looking to make it grow, you can also feed it. The best way to feed it is to put some frozen mice or shrimp or plankton in a turkey baste or a long dropper and kind of squirt it on the coral when it's open at night. And, and it'll stick to the tentacles. Yes? Is that one geoflight? Yeah, these these are th this is this has zooxanthellae in its tissue. It doesn't need highlight, but it, it definitely needs to be out in the light. You could put it in a fluorescent tank, but uh, it's under metal halides here. It's a little deplorable. This is taken in the wild. This is a, about 10 feet on a hard bottom in the Caribbean. This is Calistrea. This is another nice stony coral for the reef aquarium. You can see this one's in the process of. Uh, growing. Similar to Fabia, is it, the polyps split down the middle and one becomes two. And you can propagate this very easy to pieces just in fact I think Joey Ayula brought a piece tonight yeah. that he propagated from his aquarium. You can after it separates you can after the polyps split in two you can snap off the branches. Okay now we get into the um, small polyp stony corals, the aquapores, bacillopores, etc. Um, pretty much the general requirements if you want to keep these kind of corals is you need a well-skimmed aquarium um, free of any kind of uh, undesirable microalgae. Uh, you also need strong water movement, back and forth type water movement. You really need metal halide lighting. You can keep these under VHO fluorescence, but you really don't develop these nice bright colors or you, you don't maintain them under fluorescent lights as well as you do under metal halides. This is a stylophora that's in my 180-gallon uh, reef aquarium. That's a seriatopora. Again, you see these bright colors, pinks and purples. Uh, it, it's a clear indication that these things came from shallow, clear water. That's a posilopora. A little bit more difficult to keep than some of the other uh, small polyp stony coral, corals. Even though it, it's, it's fairly common in the wild, it seems to be, at least in captivity, very sensitive to changes in, uh, in light. So you have to be real careful if you have one of these. Uh, when you put new bulbs in or you, you put carbon in your water, that would increase the uh, UV transmissivity. I said that right? It's a hydnophora another small polyp stony coral. These do very well as, as, as do the aquapores. Again, the bright green coloration, you want to put this under bright light, you want strong water movement. These have a potent sting. You don't want to put these too close to anything. Uh, I'm not sure about this variety. I think this is the excessa. But some of the other hydnophores have uh, pretty strong uh, sting and potent tentacles. This is another variety of hydnophora. Make sure you get a healthy piece. These often come in damaged as well. And if you see any kind of brown jelly on it, that's often a protozoan, a bacterial infection that's set in, and, and that's something you don't want to buy. That's par uh, Parites asteroides from the Caribbean. Again, this bright yellow coloration, uh, it, it, which is indicative of coming from a shallow water environment. In fact, when I bought this coral, it was solid brown. I knew what it was, so I bought it, and within a week, under metal halide lights, it turned this bright yellow color. Just some pretty aquapores that I have pictures of. This is in my tank. This is one of the first corals that came out of Fiji about two and a half years ago, and it's still doing well today. Now this I took um, to show you how quickly some of these uh, stony corals grow. In fact, under the right conditions, they can grow as fast as soft corals, maybe faster in some cases. This was taken about two or three months after I bought this little coral. It was a little brown nub on a rock, and uh, it started sprouting these little blue tips, and I, I decided to take a picture of it. 
And then about three months later, it looked like this. That's the same coral. Right here. And it's, today I've given away uh, a number of pieces of this, and it's, it's in every one of my reef aquariums. <coughs> oh, wrong piece. There we go. Before and then after. And you can see the same thing with this coral. This is a Montipora. I'm not sure the time frame between these shots, but it, this is the same piece. That's the same coral. Oh. Hang in there. Okay, I, I put this here to show you how to propagate these Acroporas. This is Acropora pulchra. It was a branch that was growing into a power head, so I cut it off and I, put, I wrapped it in some uh, underwater epoxy, this is DEVCON, and then stuck it on a rock. And actually, this is in, in my, my little 20-gallon reef tank that's lit by fluorescent lights. And within a few weeks, you can see the coral laying down a new base, and the, the uh, epoxy is starting to develop coraline now. Thank you. And, and, and that's the way to propagate these. You can, you can populate uh, other aquariums in your house you can trade with your friends. It's, it's, a, it's really nice to do. And it's easy. Some propagate easier than others. Most of the staghorn types uh, grow quicker uh, than some of the thicker branched uh, aquapores and they propagate easier. So you might want to start with those. If you're, if you're just buying an aquapore for the first time, I would recommend buying a staghorn variety and stay away from things uh, like Pasolopora. Uh, which could, and, and seriatopora, which could be a little more difficult to keep. Uh, buy, buy a piece with a more open branch structure, they, they tend to be easier. Just, just uh, some other aquapores from my uh, reef aquarium. This is an interesting piece. This is actually one third of, a, of an aquapora. This, this came in from the Solomon Islands, I, I guess, I don't know, about six, eight months ago, something like that. And it was too big to fit. Tony and I wanted to buy it, but it was too big to fit in either one of our aquariums. So we, we actually cut it into three pieces on a table saw. And uh, I, I took a piece home, Tony took a piece home, and Craig Bingman took a piece home. And, they, and they're, they're doing well today. This is the one, I think this is out of Tony's aquarium. Yeah. Yeah, that's his piece. Mine pretty much looks identical to that. Just another aquapora. This one has fuzzy polyps. the Acropora loripes, which is a common import from Fiji. That's another shot of Acropora loripes. You can maintain these bright colors on the Acropora loripes, but um, what I found is, is they need direct metal halide lighting and, uh, and supplemented by actinic bulbs. Tony's going to talk a little bit more about lighting, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Okay, this little ugly critter here is a, a, a Mithrax crab. And if, if you've ever seen Acroporas up close, you'll see often there's a little commensal crabs that live in the body of the Acropora. Most of those are of, are of the genus Trapezia, and they're good because they keep the coral clean. They chase away predators like starfish and hermit crabs and, and, and larger crabs. Uh, but occasionally you'll see this little crab that comes inside the head of an Acropora. And this one isn't good. This one eats the emerging polyps. And if you see it, the only way to really get rid of it is to remove the entire head from the tank and kind of get tweezers or dental picks, because they do not come out unless you kill them uh, or really spend a lot of time getting them out. But if you see this in, in your head of aquapora, and it's fairly common, you should get it out of there. And you can see the claws on, on here. They're kind of like two little cups at the end of the claws, where it, which it uses to scrape the uh, coral. That came out of my tank, unfortunately. This is Millipora, which is fire coral. Uh, this, this you keep in a similar uh, conditions to Acropora. These come from very shallow water, bright, bright light, strong, powerful water movement um, and, in order to do well. But be careful touching these. They're, they're, they're not called fire coals for nothing. They, they actually sting as if you put your hand into a hot flame. This 
this is the tuba pora musica. This is another choral I, I generally wouldn't recommend, especially to beginners. Um, we're not sure why it's difficult to keep. There's, there's talk now that there's more than one species of this coral, some one being easy to keep and the others being difficult to keep. Apparently the ones that are most commonly seen in stores are the ones that are difficult to keep. But uh, very few people have kept this uh, long term. This is uh, Tubastrea. This is another coral I, I wouldn't recommend unless you're serious about keeping it alive. This is an ahermatypic coral, meaning that it uh, does not have any zooxanthellae in its tissues, and it gets all of its nutrition by capturing uh, free-floating uh, plankton. And in order to keep it alive, you have to feed it, uh, preferably every day, but certainly a few times a week, and each polyp has to be fed independently. It's, it's, it's a chore to keep but it's really quite pretty. And it only opens up like this at night, sometimes during the day when it senses food in the water. The other thing that makes it difficult to feed is that when you, when you try and feed it, if you have any kind of shrimp in your tank, they immediately come over and steal the food. So it's, it's uh, if you have the right kind of tank for it and you want to spend the time feeding it, you can keep it. But uh, if you're not prepared to do that, then I wouldn't buy this. Same thing with this. This is a sea fan that's, uh, that does not gain any nutrition from zooxanthellae. All of its food is uh, caught. And in order to keep it alive, you have to feed it. Tridacna clams. Um, generally, uh, the general requirements for tridacna clams, you want to have very bright lights. You can keep these under VHO lighting, but they, they look so much prettier under, under metal halides. They, they develop certain highlights that you just don't get under fluorescent lights. Uh, water movement isn't important. In fact, uh, you don't want to have too strong a water movement, just, just a gentle water movement so that they don't suffocate. This is a, a tridacna crisea. That's a Tridacna maxima from the Red Sea, which is that typical blue maxima that's been coming out of the Red Sea. Be careful when you buy, especially the ones from the Red Sea, I've noticed coming with these little par parasitic snails, the tetrella snails on the mantle. They look like grains of rice. If you notice that your clams are, are slowly um, shriveling or, or, or starting to die, um, pick it up out of the water and take a look at the bottom by the bissel gland or up by the top of the shell. Like over here, during the daytime, you'll see these little snails hiding in the scoots of the, of the clam. Um, I would, you can brush them off with a toothbrush, but the only way to really keep them from coming back is to put predators in the tank that eat them, like uh, macropharyngodon leopard wrasses or paracolinus wrasses, like six-line wrasses. But I notice the snails are very common on, on the red sea clams. It's a tridacna gigas. This is a... This is the largest of the large uh, tridacna clams. This one gets to about four feet. It's about 12 to 15 inches in my tank already. It's a little tridacna crisea. That's a tridacna derace. I shot straight down on that. The clams look the prettiest when you look straight down at them. This, this is also a large species of Tridacna clam, the Derasa. This one, these can get, uh, I have two of these that are close to a foot. That's a Tridacna squamosa in my, uh, that's in my 120 gallon reef tank. These, these are my favorite. I don't think I've ever seen an ugly Tridacna squamosa. These are the squamosa, you can, are very distinguishable from the other clams. They have the really deep scoots uh, along the side of the shell. And most of them have a pattern that's typical to this, kind of this honeycomb pattern. It's another little Tridacna maxima blue. Sponges. Um, unfortunately, sponges are not difficult to keep in the aquarium. The problem is it's almost impossible to buy one that's healthy. Most of the time they've been collected poorly. They've been handled uh, poorly. They've been taken out of the water. Once they're taken out of the water and, they, and air gets inside the pores, they, they generally start to uh, disintegrate. 
Uh, that's unfortunate because they're really not difficult to keep if, if you can obtain a healthy one. This I took in the wild. Uh, th this is not in my aquarium, unfortunately. Uh, this I took while scuba diving in Grand Cayman, where sponges are very colorful. Sponges like this are very common. This too is a, a nice encrusting sponge. Now th these definitely would be easy to keep, especially the encrusting varieties. Unfortunately, they're, they're, they're not collected, and when they are collected, they're not uh, collected very well. <coughs> the one sponge that does do fairly well if you get a healthy specimen is that blue sponge out of Indonesia. In Indonesia, it's uh, Adesia is the genus. Um, if you can get a healthy piece that's been in the store for a few days and hasn't turned white, you can, you can uh, keep that very well. I have a few pieces that are a couple of years old. In fact, I've propagated some of that bright blue sponge. And, uh, and it does very well. <coughs> what type of lighting does that make? The sponge doesn't seem to care. I have it out in bright light and it does well. I have it in the shade and it does well. The blue sponge I'm referring to. Other sponges, uh, I have a yellow sponge that doesn't like the bright light. It develops a microalgae on it. Again, that's where the hermit crabs come in handy. They keep the outside of the sponge <coughs> clean. And, uh, and, and they seem to help keep it alive. Okay, these are just some... In fact, there's the yellow sponge. Coincidentally, it's under an overhang here. Just some other animals you can keep in your reef aquarium. Just uh, this is a uh, coral banded shrimp, uh, Stenopsis uh, hispidus. These are fine for your reef aquarium. In fact, they do a nice job. If you have bristle worms in the tank, they'll they'll eat the bristle worms. If you can find a pair of them, they're much nicer. If you, They'll, they'll do fine singly in the aquarium, but it's really nice to get a pair. And they lay eggs often, and you get a lot of the, the, the larvae swimming around, which provide food for the corals. Plus, it's real nice to see them hang out together. And you see the male actually feeds the female. It's, it's an interesting thing to watch. Unfortunately, again, in, in the wild, you very rarely see a single coral banded shrimp. They're almost always in pairs, but when they collect them, they split the pairs up. Once they're split up, you, it's, it's difficult to get them back together again. But if you want to special order them, you can special order them. It's the common Lismata cleaning shrimp. These are, again, fine for the reef aquarium. Fan worms, which you can keep as long as you don't have fish or shrimp that eat them. Starfish, um, you have to be real careful with starfish. There's only a very few species that you can keep in a reef aquarium safely. Uh, the brittle stars and the serpent stars you can certainly keep, in the, and they perform a nice function of cleaning up the bottom. And starfish like this, this is a Fromia star, which, which is really a, a, the, the tritivore. I've seen it eat encrusting sponges, but I've never seen it bother corals. The little bright red starfish you occasionally see in stores, those are Fromias, those are okay to keep. The big blue linkias, those are okay to keep. Although they don't do well, I've never seen them live long term in the aquarium, so I personally wouldn't buy them. Cucumbers, uh, Halothorius species. These are really great if, if you have sand on the bottom of your tank, which I, which I recommend. Uh, they really do a great job of cleaning up the sand, taking out any organic particles and then passing it through their body and out the other end. You can, see, you can see the mouth over here. It's ingesting the sand. It passes it through the body and out the backside. This one's about a foot long. It's in my 120-gallon uh, reef tank. This, this variety I like a lot, too. I've had these for years. I probably have half a dozen throughout my reef tanks. Uh, these are the golden-headed sleepers. These are great for sifting sand, too. Unfortunately, they don't thrive in the aquarium. There just isn't enough organic matter in our, our captive reefs to, to keep these things alive. These I took at the aquarium here, a picture of the aquarium, and even, even with the large sand bottom there, I, I, Joe, what, have they survived in that tank? No. No, they didn't live there, so I, I generally don't recommend buying these. Okay, algae control. Um, some of the things you can do, the, the biggest problem certainly for, especially for beginning reef aquarists, is, is combating uh, problem algae. And, and my three-pronged method is, is first is, is biological control through zebrasoma tangs. 
and snails and hermit crabs, astrea snails, and some of the hermit crabs, uh, calcinus snail, uh, calcinus tibison, and the little blue-legged her blue hermits that come out of Florida, uh, clibinarius tricolor. Also, you want to make sure the water you use to make water changes and to replace evaporated water has been purified uh, with through, through at least a reverse osmosis filter uh, or a de deionization filter. This is one of the little herbivorous hermit crabs I was referring to. This is Calcinus tibison. You can put up to one per gallon, especially of the little small ones, uh, for one per gallon of water in your aquarium for uh, algae control. They do a great job of cleaning the rocks. Actually, they'll even mount corals and, and clean them as well. This is a Zebrasoma desjardinate. It's a sailfin tang from the Indian Ocean or Red Sea. This is a great herbivore. This one will even eat Valonia, the bubble algae. Now the sailfin from Indonesia won't. It looks similar to the Zebrasoma voliferum, uh, which is a sailfin tank from Indonesia or the Philippines, will, won't eat the bubble algae, but this one will. Yellow tank Zebrasoma flavicens, another good uh, herbivore for your reef aquarium. Zebrasoma scopus. Of all the Zebrasoma tangs, I prefer the Desjardinae and the voliferum, the sailfin tangs. They're not as skittish. I find the, the uh, yellow tang is, is skittish and it makes all the other fish in the tank nervous. And the same, the scopus tang is a little skittish and the black tang, but the, um, the sailfin tangs have a lot more personality. They're not the prettiest members, but, they, but they're a little more personable and, and they, they tend to stay calm. It's a little chevron tang in my, my uh, 180 gallon reef aquarium. These, these are great herbivores. They won't eat long uh, hair algae, but th they'll actually even eat cyanobacteria. They help keep the sand clean. They'll suck the top of the sand. Any algae that falls on top of the sand, um, or that grows on top of the sand, they'll, they'll suck it off. They'll, they'll eat the algae off the walls of the aquarium and the rocks. Any kind of encrusting microalgae, they, they just love, even, even cyanobacteria. That's a uh, Paracanthorus uh, hepatis, the hippo tang. Uh, even though it's a tang, this is really not a good herbivore. It'll, it'll eat uh, some leafy green macroalgae, but it's uh, generally a, a planktivore. But a good reef tank fish. It's uh, generally harmless. This, this one's in my 180 reef. Uh, I say generally harmless. This one happens to be a nasty one. <laughs> but that's unusual. That's a Rainford goby. This, this is also a, a little fish that will eat algae and, and process detritus. In fact, if you look close, you can see it had just taken a mouth of detritus and it's now spitting it out through its gills. These come from Australia. I wouldn't recommend these for a small tank. They don't really eat prepared foods and unless you have enough for them to graze on in the tank, especially hair algae, they, they generally don't thrive. Some other fish you can keep in a reef aquarium. This is a, uh, a, a paracolinus uh, filamentosus, a filamentous wrasse. These are the, the filamentous wrasses and the uh, uh, flash, uh, flasher wrasses in general are uh, all planktivores. Um, they, they do not bother anything in the reef aquarium. The only thing you have to keep in mind with these is they need to be fed at least once a day in order to maintain body weight because they don't pick around the rocks. So the, the only nutrition they get is what you throw in the water. This is a, a fairy wrasse, zero labor uh, Jordanite from Hawaii, the Hawaiian flame wrasse. Another planktivore that does very well in a reef aquarium. The Scots fairy wrasse, zero labor Scotorum. That's the Lubbock Fairy Rass, Zero Labus uh, Lubbock guy. This is in my 180 gallon reef aquarium. If you're going to put any of these uh, fairy wrasses in, uh, they're generally docile, but if you have uh, existing wrasses like uh, uh, the Pseudocolinus wrasses, like six line wrasses and four line wrasses, some of the Halicaries wrasses in your tank already, or Chorus wrasses, uh, and, they're there, and they're in your tank first, they'll beat these guys up if you try and put them in afterwards. So 
If you want these type of wrasses in there, the fairy wrasses, the flasher wrasses, you should put them in first or get rid of the other fish. But they're generally tough fish and they do very nicely. Again, similar to the fairy and flasher wrasses, the antheas are planktivores and you really need to feed them at least daily in order to keep them alive. Another little sunburst antheus that's in my 180 gallon reef tank. These don't compete well for food. I, I wouldn't put these in a tank with aggressive feeders. Uh, they, they eat prepared foods, but, they, uh, but they, they don't mix it up with the, uh, with the bigger fish. So that, and they wait for something to pass by them to eat. So um, It's not, not a good fish if you have other aggressive feeders in the tank. Stark eye damsy, uh, damsel, Crispatera uh, stark eye. It's a good, uh, good fish for the reef aquarium. It can be a little aggressive, but it's uh, it's quite pretty. This is they're from Australia. Myacanthus blennies, which is a, another nice little fish. Again, they're planktivores. You really need to feed these guys every day if you want them to thrive. Be careful when you buy these. If you see them with a hollow belly. Then I would pass. This one, this one's okay. That's uh, Meacanthus gramistes, another one of the saber-tooth blennies. Uh, they're planktivores. This one's in my 120-gallon reef tank. One of my favorite fish. Eats uh, flake foods, everything. It's a strange fish too. No, it 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 has. Uh, it's called a saber-tooth blenny because it has two fang, two poisonous fangs in its in its mouth. But they're used for defensive purposes only. But apparently the other fish know this because I've never ever seen a fish bother this. And, and I've never seen it bother anything. Little Assessor goby, Assessor flavissimus. These are the yellow Assessor gobies out of Australia. These are great, but they're, uh, they're not very common. But again, they're planktivores and you need to feed these guys. Lyopropoma rubre, the Swiss guard basslet. It's a deep water basslet from the Caribbean. Not very common, but this, this, is, this is, again, is another one of my favorite fish. It uh, does great in a reef aquarium where it kind of pokes in and, in and out around the rocks and overhangs. Doesn't like the bright light, but uh, it'll come out when you feed. Pseudochromus friedmani uh, from the Red Sea. Uh, I have a pair of these in my 180 gallon reef tank, so does Tony. It's a, it's a really neat fish. Um, you don't want to put this in too small a tank. Any of the pseudochromus, if they're, if they're in a small confined space, can be nasty and territorial. But in, in our large reef aquariums, they're, they're quite docile. And they're real hardy fish. You can't kill these guys with a stick. Always on the move, poking in and out of the rocks. Uh, and, they, and they maintain that bright color. There's another little purple pseudo the, uh, from, uh, from Indo, the uh, Pyriferous, I believe that's uh, purple like this, but, but it loses that purple coloration after a year in captivity. The uh, Friedman I seem to maintain it. It's worth spending a few extra bucks for the uh, Pseudochromus Friedmana. It's a flame hawkfish. In fact, there's the blue sponge I was talking about earlier. These are, these are fine in the reef aquarium. I've heard stories of them eating cleaner shrimp and astrea snails, but I don't think that's a major concern. I guess if you have a gigantic flame hawk and a little tiny shrimp, it, it might eat it and you put the shrimp in afterwards, but generally they're safe. Very personable fish. There's an old picture of my six line wrasse, Pseudo, Pseudocalinus uh, hexatania. These can be nasty uh, when they get larger, especially to other wrasses like the fairy and flasher wrasses, but. Uh, I love these fish because they're always on the move, poking in and out of the rocks. They also have very good control of those parasitic snails I mentioned earlier. This is the fish to, that eats those snails off of the clams. Uh, the leopard wrasses, Macropharyngodon bipartitis. Uh, these, you want to keep these fish, I, I recommend having sand in your tank. They, they sleep in the sand and they look for sand every night after the lights go out. These can be difficult to keep, but we're really not sure why. Some do very well in captivity, some, despite eating, just waste away. We suspect there's some kind of internal parasitic worms or trematodes. Um, we're not quite sure. But this is from the Indian Ocean, this leopard rat. 
That's the uh, leopard wrasse from Hawaii, Macrofringodon geoffrei, or the potter's wrasse. And this one's doing very well for me. I don't know why. And I've had others the exact same size, eating the exact same food, and they just don't thrive. It's hit or miss. But this one seems a little bit easier than the other leopard wrasses. Maybe because it's collected better in Hawaii, it's got a shorter trip, I'm not sure. But it, it adapts uh, to, to food, prepared food, very quickly. The wrasse on top of that is a, uh, not a good picture. I wasn't taking his picture. That's a pseudogeloides. This particular species, which is as of yet, uh, yet to be identified, is, is very good. You see this in the store, it's worth buying. Um, there, there's another pseudogeloides out of Hawaii, the Saracinus, the pencil wrasse, the red with a bright green stripe. That doesn't seem to do well in captivity, but this one does well. Again, these are all good for the reef aquarium. They're, they're generally don't bother anything. They'll pick it along the rocks at some of the micro crustaceans, amphipods, and copepods, but they, they won't bother your corals, clams, or crabs. This fish I got recently, that's the Macrofringodon uh, chiotai from, from Australia. This one seems to be doing very well. I, maybe I shouldn't talk about it. I might jinx it, but it's, it's eating, eating like a pig, and, and it's adapted to captivity very nicely. These two are very good at controlling the parasitic snails on the, on the clams. They, in fact, that's what they live upon in nature. They eat, uh, they eat tiny snails and tiny crabs and other little micro crustaceans. So if you have a problem with, uh, with parasitic snails on your, your tridacna clams, the, these guys are, are a good choice. This is, this is hard to find in the store, but uh, it's worth looking for. That's a uh, copper band Kelman uh, rostratus. This, this is a mix for a reef aquarium. It, it'll definitely eat any kind of tube worms or anemones. Uh, it'll generally leave everything else alone. Occasionally it might pick on a clam or a favia, but they're, they're generally safe for a reef aquarium. They're great if, you, if your tank is overrun with Aptasia anemones, those little uh, pesky brown anemones. These are a good choice because they'll, they'll, they'll clean your tank out of those anemones within a few days. Again, these are hard to find. Uh, some thrive in captivity, some don't. Make sure if you buy them that, that it's a full-bodied fish and that it's not pinched. If it has a pinched dorsal musculature, I wouldn't buy it. And also see it eating at the store. The ones from, Philip, from the Philippines and Indo are, are usually caught with cyanide and don't make good, uh, good captive uh, fish. The ones from Australia, which are really nice, unfortunately often come in the size of dinner plates. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure what to tell you. But if you, if you see one that's eating in the store uh, and it's got a, a full body, especially above the head here, that dorsal musculature, look at the fish head on. And, and if that area is full, it's fine. If you see that area pinched at all, that means the fish is starving and it probably won't live. These are, these are the next few fish are some really cool fish, but uh, unfortunately um, <laughs> I wouldn't put them in a reef tank. <coughs> It's a bad fish. A masked uh, puffer from the Red Sea. This will eat about anything it can, it can catch. And lastly, this is a uh, Ketodon semilurvatus, which is from the Red Sea. Nice, one of, the, one of the few butterflies that do very well in captivity. These guys can eat flake food once they're settled in. But I wouldn't put it in a tank with uh, invertebrates that you don't want it to eat anyway. <laughs> I think that's it for my segment. Tony's up next. He's going to show you some tanks, some equipment, and uh, and I guess we'll have a Q&A afterwards. I don't know. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, sir? Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Just give one second. We'll uh, change over the slides. And, and, uh, Tony and Greg, they, they both know their stuff, as you see, extremely well. And I don't know how Greg remembers all the scientific names. I'm always in wonder at that. I um, wonder too. <laughs> so Lydia wonders too. How does he remember that? So these, uh, they both have their fortes, and uh, I guess Tony's going to go into the lighting and some equipment uh, requirements. All right, the first thing we'll start talking about tonight is rainbow fish. Is rainbow fish. <laughs> okay, uh, basically, um, there's several parameters to keeping a reef system. Um, one is lighting, the other one is live rock, 
uh, proper protein skimming depending upon the uh, system you intend on keeping. Water movement, very crucial for the stimulation of the corals. Um, activated carbon, uh, some people use it, others don't. Um, we'll go into that, why it should be used and why it shouldn't be used. Uh, live sand, live sand is making a big hit right now. Um, a lot of people use it and they find that they keep replacing it over and over and it's because the sand is dissolving and as it dissolves, you need to replace it. It's giving nutrients to the animals in the tanks. Okay, um, we're going to start off first with showing a couple of reef tanks. Uh, this is Greg Scheimer's 180 gallon reef tank. As you can see, it's loaded. And you know what's funny? You see this tank? Every time we go out together, he seems to always find another <laughs> coral to buy. Where does he put it? I have no idea. Then he starts complaining, oh, everything is hitting one another. You can see why. Uh, here's another section of the tank. This is the center. And you can see it's heavily populated in there. The fish are hiding. Here's another side of it. Uh, this is the 180. Um, basically, this system is run with one actinic VHO, one 50-50 VHO, and three 175 watt metal halides. Uh, the bulbs that he is, he's using in this system is the uh, Hamilton, which no longer exists, 6K bulb. Uh, they have been taken off the market, so we have to rely on another company to bring them in. Uh, he also runs this with a 120 gallon reef sump. And the sump is basically circulating the water. This is his 120 gallon reef system. Um, in this system, he has a 60 gallon sump. He has two metal halides, 175 watts. And he also has the VHO 5050 and a VHO 03 Atenic. Uh, you can see this tank is heavily populated as well. And he still keeps shopping. Every weekend he brings home a fish, right Lydia? I don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Terry Siegel's aquarium. Uh, this tank has changed somewhat since uh, this picture. As you can see, he keeps a uh, variety of stony corals as well as soft corals. He's got gorgonians in here. He's got a gonopore in here. Uh, this system has changed somewhat in the sense that he has three reef aquariums that were all separate systems. Uh, today he has grouped all those systems into one with a sump in his basement and a giant protein skimmer on it. And needless to say, all the tanks are doing very well. Uh, this one here, he's using three 175 watt metal halides and like I said, the sump in the basement. Uh, this is my 150 gallon reef aquarium. Um, this is an old picture. This is what it used to look like about two years ago. And this is what one side of it looks like now. This is the center. And this is the other side. On this system, I'm running two 175 watt metal halides with a 400 watt metal halide in the center. I believe in a lot of lighting for acroporas. Um, you can definitely get away with 75 watts, 175 watt application, um, but I love a lot of watts. Um, the sump on this is. Yeah. Well, those kind of bills are big. I don't show them to my wife. Um, basically, this one runs with a sump as well. It's a, it has a 60 gallon sump. Um, I designed I designed the sump so that way when I do water changes, I don't dis disturb the tank at all. So basically, the water changes are being created through the sump and not the tank. So at any time does the tank ever get affected with the water change. Um, the other good reason behind having a big sump is due to the fact that if your system ever shuts down, the sump can hold all the water that's being sent back into the, from the tank into the sump. Um, this is the Brooklyn Aquarium's uh, reef aquarium. This is a 1,200 gallon reef system. Um, very massive, beautiful looking tank. 
Uh, Joey Ayulo was running it at that time. And um, I don't know how it's doing. How's it doing now, Joe? I haven't seen it in six months, so. I saw it last month. Uh... And um, it's, it, it's a very magnificent tank. Like I said, it's 1,200 gallons. So when you go see this tank, it's really very interesting. Uh, this one has a 1,000 watt metal halide with two 400 watt metal halides on it. And the corals are growing like crazy in it. So it's a really nice tank. Um, this tank, we put this picture here. Uh, this tank is no longer in existence. Um, I can give you a few reasons why. Number one, the chemicals that were being added into this system were basically calcium chloride, uh, trying to buff up the buffering system. It doesn't work. That, that application does not work with a system like this when you're trying to keep a lot of stony corals. Um, the other reason is this grade here in the bottom. Whenever you put a grade like this in the bottom and you suspend everything above it, everything that falls down in through these little holes stay down there and it starts to accumulate. And the more it accumulates, the more junk and toxins you're leaving in the system. Basically, this slide is in here to, rec to show you of something not to do. It does look pretty, but the prettiness is only short-lived and then the disasters start to come as time goes by. So don't do this. Uh, this is Joey Ayulo's 120 gallon reef tank. Uh, basically he's running this with a sump in the basement, uh, very good protein skimming, and a 400 watt metal halide above the system. Um, you can see the line right here where the divider is from the from right above, the, the bulb should be right here and it's just sending the shadow down the line. Um, this is a very nice tank and all these corals have grown drastically in the system. As well with him, he has the live sand in here and it dissolves constantly. He finds himself replacing the sand. Like how often, Joe? Every, every couple of months. Every few months, right? Yeah. Okay, this is Gary Shepherd's Guy. Um, I'm trying to remember whose tank this is. Oh, that's right. <laughs> this is Jim Carbone's 220 gallon reef system. This is really nice. You got to go see this. This is a uh, Clinton Pet Center's display tank. And if you ever go there, don't try because I've tried talking him out of many corals in that tank. And it was like a waste of time. He will not sell you a pinch of any of those corals in there. And basically, you can't blame him. Look at the growth in here, look at the colors. He has a very, very nice tank. Um, he also lights this tank with VHO lighting, uh, metal halides, protein skimming, and um, basically that's it with a nice large sump. Uh, he adds calcium hydroxide to the system, and it does very well. And this is also in his tank. Uh, this is right above one of the pre-filters. And this is a mangrove. And uh, this we put here to show that mangroves can be kept in reef tanks as well, as long as you have the lighting for it. His lighting happens to be about a foot from the surface. So he's able to keep the mangrove. I like to see in about two years where that mangrove is. Okay, this is Gary Shepherd's stony coral tank. Uh, this is where he keeps his SPS corals. Um, basically, he runs his system with uh, metal halides as well, a VHO, and he has a huge, large sump in his basement with excellent protein skimming. Basically, I, you know, I like to point out that all these tanks we're showing, they're very basic. It's nothing complicated. A lot of people think you have to get all these different types of gadgets. It's, it really isn't necessary. Ozone is not necessary. UV is not necessary. So you can see that all these tanks are just being kept basic. You know, they're dosing, uh, good lighting, good live rock, and that's generally all you need. Uh, this is his soft coral tank, and this is for all the people who say, can you mix stony corals with soft corals? You can do that all in one tank as long as you don't get a little out of hand. Now his system, he's got two tanks and they're all merged into one system with the sump. Uh, people say that the soft corals pull out a toxin, 
that killed the uh, stony corals. Well, if that was the case, take for example all the toxins that would get transferred to the sump and then returned into his stony coral tank. You can't keep it as long as you, you know, don't put them all close together and like choke them with one another. This is also in his, this is another sump that he has connected to the system with a mangrove as well. As you can see, he has the metal halide above the mangroves and they're doing very well. That's salt water there. Um, this is also connected to his sump. So basically he has two tanks, one refugium and a sump. Okay. Let's talk about lighting. Lighting basically comes in two formats, fluorescent and metal halides. Uh, the fluorescents come in standard, high output, VHO. Uh, metal halides come in different Calvin readings. 55, 65, 6K, which isn't up there, uh, 10K and 20K. All these bulbs have a purpose in a reef system, and it all determines on what your, what your desire is to keep. If you desire to keep uh, soft corals or the large polyp stony corals that Greg was talking about earlier, you can basically keep them in fluorescent aquariums, or you can use the 10K application. Um, I tried the 10K. I do a lot of experimenting with lighting. I found that the 10K really didn't do anything for my stony corals. If anything, the older stony corals I had started to recede immediately two weeks after installing a 10K bulb. I really didn't get good results out of it, so I really don't recommend it. Uh, what I do recommend is the 55, 65, 6K bulb application for the stony corals. As far as the other corals are concerned, you can vary your lighting depending upon what kind of system you intend on keeping. Should we time? Yes. Uh, would that be because of the color of the 10K? Um, what I found was not that the color of the 10K um, gave the bad results. It was the intensity. The intensity wasn't strong enough. Basically, when you go diving in a coral reef, and basically all these animals that we have in our aquariums are coming out of 18 inches to, I would say about 10 feet of water. When you go down there, you find that the water is very high color spectrum. It has all the, all the uh, different colors of the spectrum in there. It also has very intense glitter lines. When you put a 10K bulb on an aquarium, you find that you diminish the glitter lines and you also lose those other color spectrums and you find that you have a whitish blue colored tank yeah. with very low glitter lines and when you go diving that's not exactly what you see you see that basically at 90 feet 85 feet that's the kind of uh, color you find when you dive at that depth but at shallow ends where these all these corals are coming from you're talking about basically all the color group and you need that. And I found with the 10K, you're not getting that. So I find it's very important to try to emulate and try to give the corals exactly what they have out in the ocean. And they're not getting that with the 10K. Okay, this is Gary Shepherd's uh, soft coral tank. The reason we put this one in here, uh, I'm showing off the metal halides. Uh, you can see he has three 150 watt metal halides. These are the Awasaki bulbs. Now, if you notice, they're about a foot from the surface of the tank. This is great when you have the soft corals. See, you can use the metal halides on a soft coral tank, but if these lights were right above the system where most people usually put their lighting right here, you would burn these corals. These corals would not do well. They would cringe. Uh, they would start to slime up. They wouldn't do well. So this is a great example of how, yeah, you can use the metal halides, but, you know, use them with caution. Bring them up when you put them on the soft corals. Okay, this is a sump. Um, basically, I like to show you how uh, a good sump should really work. Most people take a wet-dry filtration system and turn it into a sump. Uh, what they find is that they get a lot of return when they get the water returned back into the tank they find a lot of small bubbles coming back into the system and that's because a wet dry sump is not designed 
for a reef aquarium as far as a Berlin method with no bio balls. The drip plate is too high, the water level is too low. So basically what you've got is a rain effect and the rain is creating a lot of bubbles. So what we found is when you, have, when you design your own sump, uh, basically now they're going to start coming out with sumps designed for the reef aquarium um, with some sort of design like this. Basically the water comes down from the system into the drip plate. The drip plate as you notice and the water level are very close in proximity. When you have this like this, the rain effect is shortened so if your water level was down here, you would get a splashing rain effect. It would create a lot of bubbles, but when it's this high, you lessen the bubbles. Any bubbles that are created, since this divider is here and the opening is under here, you fuse out the bubbles, and the bubbles, bas the bubbles basically come back up, but don't go into this chamber. So that's definitely a way of doing it. Also, using a micron pad is another way of mechanical filtration you get to remove a lot of the uh, sediment that goes up into your pre-filters. I recommend this highly so that way you can catch all the stuff before it goes back into the tank. Um, over here on this side, as you can see, plumbing is very important. Plumbing, when you plumb up a system, basically you should have a ball valve on one side and a ball valve on the other with a true union. In a situation like this, what happens is if the system, if the pump ever goes down and you need to replace the pump, all you do is shut these two valves down, water won't come out this way and water won't come back down this way. So basically you can save yourself a lot of headache. People that don't have this have to empty out the sump and then remove the pump. That's a big headache. Uh, basically also when the system shuts down you have a check valve here. As water goes up, I like these check valves better than any other. Uh, the ball check valve, there's a problem with it because what happens is you have a ball here and as the water gets sent back up, it creates back pressure. The back pressure puts, makes the pump run harder. You don't want the pump to run harder. You want the pump to run efficiently. It lasts a lot longer that way. So with this wide check valve, basically what it does is it pushes the prong up into here and it flows the water freely straight up. So when the system does shut down, the prong just comes out of the side right into place and it prevents the water from coming down. So this is definitely something I would recommend highly. Also back here, GFI, uh, which is called ground fault interrupters. Basically if a power head goes bad in your system or you're working in the system and the light hood happens to fall in the water and your hand is in the water talk about fried chicken <laughs> basically with the GFI you will not have to worry about these problems you can stick your arm in the tank the light will fall it'll shut it down as soon as it feels one drop of water contact electricity it shuts the system down so you do not have to worry about it. now the only thing I caution you with GFIs is that GFIs only have a two-year warranty. And I found that out personally because I had a problem with my sump and a friend of mine was helping me and when he touched the sump, he got shocked. Basically, they lose their warranty after two years, so what I recommend is on a monthly basis, check your GFIs, make sure that they're working properly. So that way you don't go into a situation as well. How do you check the GFI? Uh, basically, GFIs have a switch on them. And the switch, you can power on and off. If you hit the off power and it stays on, I think it's time to replace the GFI. So that's definitely a way of doing it. Those are the good GFIs. You can find those at Sears for like $11. But, you know, it's a life insurance. Uh, the other thing in this system is a calcium rea uh, uh, carbon reactor. You have a carbon reactor here with this power head here. It just basically sends water from here into here and it, purif it helps clean the system out. Uh, carbon, you should be very careful how you use carbon. For those who have never used carbon before, um, I stress a lot of caution because when you use it, it can really sparkle the tank.